Hello everyone, I'm Alex Huller and welcome to this week's edition of Cloudbusters. I'm joined as usual by my co-host Mallory Bedreau and this week we're looking into a question from our community around containerization. Looking at containerization technology, it often seems like a silver bullet. Should we containerize everything? And actually, where is it appropriate to use this technology? And Mallory, I feel like we've got a really awesome guest this week to help us unwrap that myth. That is right, Alex. We are thrilled to welcome today Bala Kaliamurthy, who is the Senior Product Manager for Containers at Aptio Cloudability. Thank you for joining us, Bala. Thanks, guys. So, Bala, if you could kick us off, what are your thoughts, this idea that we should containerize everything? Uh, what do you think? Why to containerize in the first place, right? Uh, there are quite a few benefits, but I would like to put emphasis on uh, three most important like factors or I would say benefits. First thing is like in our consistent environment. Containers give companies the ability to create a predictable environment uh, that is isolated from other applications. So that would include all the software dependencies by the application, such as the uh, runtime system libraries and tools, et cetera. A consistent environment uh, translates to rapid deployments, patching and scaling up applications. And what that means is uh, the developers and uh, IT ops teams spend less time uh, debugging and diagnosing issues and more time shipping products and features. Another benefit is like, of course, affordability. Uh, you know, containers can run anywhere, virtually anywhere. It could be on Linux, it could be on Windows, Mac operating systems on virtual machines, bare metal or uh, in data center on premise, and of course in the public cloud. So this portability aspect between different platforms and cloud greatly eases the workload on development and deployments. So it's, it's truly a right ones, run anywhere capability. So that's a big factor. And I think the third one would be the, uh, the isolation. Uh, containers virtualize CPU, memory, storage, and network resources at the OS level, at the OS level, enabling uh, less system requirements and thereby uh, less overhead consumption. So I guess like for all these reasons, we should containerize if it becomes beneficial for companies. Does that mean we should containerize everything? Not everything, like, as I said, um, these are the three important factors. And if a company feels like uh, these three capabilities fit into their overall like uh, architecture, I would say they should go with it. So that also means like, you know, we could talk about what you should containerize and how much you should containerize, right? So I would say uh, for any companies looking into containerization, containerize, containerizing their application, there are a few considerations to look into. Uh, I would say scalability is one. Uh, containers are ideal for building highly scalable infrastructure and applications uh, because you can spin container instances up and down quickly. So if you have workloads that needs to scale significantly, containers could be a good fit for them. Another one would be the updates, right? Um, containers are also a good fit for applications that needs to be updated quickly and continuously. This does not mean that uh, you can't do continuous updates using other deployment technologies. However, uh, because containers allow you to uh, push out updates quickly and imitably by deploying new container images. They offer a good solution for workloads where fast, reliable updates are a priority. And that's another, I would say, a consideration to look into. And um, another one would be the persistent data needs. Um, containers can certainly support persistent data storage, but uh, this is a consideration you need to look into based on the need. Uh, the more persistent data you have to store, and the more complex your uh, storage needs are, the more complicated it will uh, be able to it will be to connect the data to a containerized application in a way that is scalable, meets security and access control requirements. So, uh, you know, as I said, uh, going back to your uh, question, do you need to containerize everything? I would say uh, the answer is no. Uh, it all comes down to what the companies see for them to be a good fit, and uh, these are the few considerations I would look into uh, for containerization. You talk about the benefits. Okay, okay, I can do these real-time updates. I get great scalability. I've got great portability between platforms. You know, where's the catch here? Because it sounds like I'm getting an awful lot of capability here for not a lot of effort, but maybe I'm missing something. No, so I guess uh, what I actually like, you know, started is like, when you say why to containerize, 
I kind of brought about this rapid uh, deployment functionality, right? But then um, what I'm looking at, let's say like you have this big like monolithic uh, application that actually requires a big persistent data needs. Um, you know, I'm looking into the fact that can you break down that application uh, into like you know microservices? Uh, so that's where like uh, the challenge is, right? Um, so the more persistent data you have to store, I'm not saying like you know containers can't do it; they can do it. It's just that like you know you got to look in and weigh in other uh, options. Like uh, you know, does that does that meet the security? So when you break down the persistent data into smaller microservices. Does it meet the security and access control requirements? These are some of the capabilities to look into. If you think, uh, you know, that meets your need, then you should containerize it. But it's a very important, like, you know, criteria for companies to look into. Something you said, Bala, that I really appreciated was the idea of does your application need scalability or not? Right. There are plenty of applications that are relatively steady state they may not be the best candidate in terms of the level of effort to containerize in comparison with the benefits that you get, right? Something that can be containerized, but doesn't have to be. But where my mind started going as we were chatting was the idea that an enterprise coming out of a data center into a more agile place like public cloud, uh, their mentality may not be uh, container ready. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, the the scalability in the data center, you would just scale for your busiest day of the year, whatever that might be, Black Friday, New Year's Eve, whatever it is. So, yeah. so you were already scaled, if that makes sense, in a steady state. So it almost feels like culturally to containerize well, first you need to shift your mindset towards something more agile, more of a just-in-time provisioning, and then look at your applications and workloads to say, okay, now who's a good candidate? Because we can do this in a different way than we used to in the data center. That's that's right. That's a good point you brought about, uh, Mallory. The reason is, um, you know, what I've seen is, uh, you know, when I talk about or when we go to the challenges of containerization, what I've seen is like, you know, adapting processes to support containers is a main thing a lot of the companies struggle. The reason is, as exactly as you mentioned, um, a lot of the companies have their uh, development teams following an agile process but their IT ops team is not prepared for it, right? Because when you actually um, move, in, move into a, a container environment, it's pretty much like in a rapidly evolving environment. You gotta like, you know, do a, a, a consistent uh, deployments and you're doing a rapid patching. Everything is pretty uh, rapid. And a lot of uh, IT ops, like cloud ops and DevOps aren't prepared for that. So I know, I know your question is like pretty specific to how things work during this uh, scalability or during the Black Friday uh, scaling and ramen. But that's actually a big challenge I, I see for companies uh, moving forward. Yeah, so companies need to adapt to a processes that helps them deal with how the container image are created and also the velocity of the container creation and scheduling. Uh, for sure, it's just it's just not about like you know, changing your architecture, it's also changing your mindset as well and uh, moving along with how you wanna support and manage containers for sure as you said, over-provisioned. Let's explore that a little more. What are you seeing and how do you think about that when you think about right-sizing a container versus right-sizing a standard VM? Bigger challenges for containerization. That's like, you know, optimizing infrastructure for uh, the, the application, right? Um, there are a lot of tools to help customers, like, you know, optimize the resources in the infrastructure, or, I mean, the container infrastructure. For example, Cloudability is actually one among them. And um, in our tool, we kind of like also uh, give our surface out information that's specific to like how much CPU has been used versus like, you know, that's been allocated, the memory, the network storage. On top of it, we also have the uh, pod optimization uh, feature. So these are some of like, you know, the capabilities that customers can use to kind of like, you know, see if they're optimizing the, the risk, the exact like, you know, resources, the container resources. So that's what I would say, like, you know, uh, th it is a challenge, but um, there are a lot of like, you know, tools out there that can help customers like uh, fix that gap. Uh, one of the biggest challenges for finance folks when it comes to containers is they were just starting to learn the jargon of cloud. And, and now it's like, oh, I don't know, they were just starting to learn Spanish and now you're asking them to speak Italian. Like, well, and maybe any tips or tricks you have for the finance team who's trying to allocate and charge back this bill, 
where you've got virtual machines inside of virtual machines? So there are a lot of options out there to kind of like, you know, surface out the information the FinOps people uh, require for their use cases. And uh, if you uh, look at uh, containers as a whole, uh, we can also uh, pretty much uh, collect the total cost for a cluster. We could go by a namespace. We could go by the services as well as the labels. So there are different actually uh, options available, like how you want to surface that information. Well, and, and you just said namespaces and labels, which are container constructs. But once right. a finance team understands, well, this namespace will identify the team and this label will identify the application ID and cost code. Oh, yeah. now we've translated these you know, technical terms into something that finance recognizes, right? And you're able to bridge that gap. Right. right. So it, what might seem very intimidating at first is, in fact, a couple of new vocabulary words to translate it back into very familiar territory. Uh, there is still a small gap where uh, a lot of FinOps people, when they uh, jump into containers, are a little concerned about all the jargons, technical jargons. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm like, you know, hoping with the due course of time, they understand, like, you know, what clusters are. And then, like, you know, of course, namespaces, uh, services and labels are something we, we want to like, you know, make sure they are aware of it, right? So we, we need to make a, a better, I would say, build a better solution or build a better uh, documentation that surfaces or bridges this gap. The digital natives, right, born in the cloud, they're very comfortable with containerization, right? That, that goes without saying, I would almost argue. The enterprises, what I see more frequently is the net new applications when they have a cloud first strategy those will be containerized, then the things that were lift and shift out of data center into cloud, it takes some time, right? You have to figure right. out, is something a monolith that can be broken down? And if so, should all of it be broken down into microservices or just a few pieces? Um, another thing I'm seeing that I'm, I'm keen to get both your thoughts on is we talk a lot about vendor portability, but honestly, I don't see it. You know, typically our vendor, uh, t excuse me, typically enterprises have a strategic vendor, maybe two strategic vendors. So they're containerizing for the benefits Bala mentioned earlier, right? The scalability, not the vendor portability. What do you two think? Mallory, that's an interesting point because I feel like when we're dealing with folks who are in say procurement or as a kind of the vendor management functions, they look at kind of this desire, they have, they have this desire to say, right, I need to be able to, in theory, lift my entire workload from cloud vendor A to cloud vendor B in one go to avoid kind of vendor lock-in and kind of negotiation pressure. Uh, and I, I hear container uh, containerization technology being held up as a way to avoid that vendor lock-in. But then I've gone to speak to some engineers and then they will say, well, well, no, well, AKS works very differently from GKE, from, you know, they have their own subtleties in the way those managed platforms are working. So. I mean, Bala, do you think that is kind of a valid argument that you can use containers to avoid that vendor lock-in or is that it's not the case? And from, from a customer perspective, uh, I see a few different scenarios. One is, as I said, it could be a pretty legacy application that's been running on one vendor for the longest time. And when they want to go to containers, they might prefer the same vendor and uh, use some of their available toolings to uh, break down the application to microservices. And uh, there might be some old applications which they might actually rebuild and think maybe uh, this could work better in another actually vendor and they could go towards it. So I just feel um, there, there is actually an uh, option to do it, but it also comes down to the comfort zone uh, uh, for customers, right? So if, if they have been like used to a specific, uh, uh, like let's say uh, Microsoft Azure and their team is all like an, uh, an expert on it, they would like to stick to it. So Bala, thinking about containers, containerization, the transition to it, what should people avoid? What kind of mistakes are you seeing out there? I guess like, um, so one of the main is like, uh, companies think uh, containers actually replace automation. Uh, it doesn't, right? So containers are uh, very specific to infrastructure. And at the end of the day, you still need to automate the release process, the tooling, et cetera. Uh, another thing is like, you know, uh, companies treat containers the same as virtual machines. Uh, they are different from the traditional virtual machines. Uh, so containers are immutable and stateless. And this lack of understanding can lead to significant challenges, uh, especially around compliance. So you need to think of a clear strategy to manage containers. 
And another mistake I've seen is a poor uh, configuration management. So you need to have a well-defined configuration file that containers use to find its individual assets, like the database storage and uh, some of the secrets like the single sign-on, et cetera. So those are three common mistakes I've seen. In your experience then, I guess, because what you're talking about here actually requires a lot of different and new skills that are actually, well, you mentioned earlier with the, the vendor landscape is changing, the technology is changing. This is quite, you know, this is, this is quite, you know, still an emerging space. How have you found it actually finding kind of the kind of engineers, product and application owners who've got the right mix of knowledge of how this new infrastructure works, how that kind of release process, how that application management process should work in this environment? Is that a challenge for yourself and for organizations, do you feel? Um, I would think so. Uh, you know, when you, it's kind of like a, a big change, uh, both from a process perspective, as well as like skills perspective. That's when, like, you know, um, when I actually spoke about the challenges, um, I also wanted to talk about how much you need to containerize, right? So if I, if I have to answer the question, how much you need to containerize, if, if a company, like, you know, asks that question, I would say, of course, the extent of your infrastructure that you containerize will vary depending on your needs, right? So I would say some factors to consider when deciding how much to containerize are for sure, um, does your actually team have the expertise? Do your engineers already know how to deploy uh, Docker and integrate containers into their CI CD pipeline? So there are a lot of questions uh, companies need to look into. And to go back to your question, uh, skills, that, that is actually something I'm seeing in the field that it's a challenge. Uh, people are like, you know, equipping themselves like with all these uh, new technologies, as well as like, you know, adapting to what's evolving or right? changing and evolving in the market and bringing in no, new people who have an expertise in it. Um, you know, it's kind of like hiring new people or uh, kind of bringing in uh, folks from other teams within the organization that are aware of all these technologies. So there are a few things happening in, within the company. But yeah, that's that's something uh, for sure uh, companies need to look into, right? You you can't just like, you know, move into, uh, think about moving to containers without the expertise. So you need to like uh, look into that factor as well. Bali, you've done such a great job at explaining. There are lots of benefits, lots of good reasons, but of course they come with their own challenges. So thank you so much for your insight today. We really appreciated you joining us and sharing what you've seen and heard. Thank you everyone for watching again today. And if you want to get in touch, you can join the Cloud Busters LinkedIn group. Uh, you can also email Alex and me at cloudbusters at aptio.com. If you have any questions or requests, you can send us a voicemail, an email, uh, a LinkedIn note, carrier pigeon, we'll take it all. <laughs> Mallory, in that case, as we've been covering containers this week, I'm intrigued to see if you have a containerization themed hat in your collection. Team. I feel like that one is pretty unusual. Team, I am so excited for this episode's hat. Uh, I've been waiting for Bala to come and join us for the containers conversation as much for the content as for the hat. Content was great. I know now, now I'm overhyping. So let's just get to the good stuff. So of course, the idea of tech containerization borrows its terminology from shipping containers. Um, and if you ever get bored on a Saturday night in COVID lockdown, go ahead and check out how standardization of shipping containers changed transportation as we know it and effectively lowered transportation costs to zero. It, it changed the global economy. That's not what we're here to talk about today, but it's really interesting. So we've already got this, this containerization uh, reference to shipping. And on top of that, Kubernetes, the, the platform, is in fact named from the Greek word for helmsman or pilot. That is to say the person steering the ship. So in my hat collection, there is a clear winner for today. And that is very obviously my sailor hat. Very nice, <laughs> very nice. <laughs> oh, thank you everyone so much for watching this episode of Cloudbusters and we will see you on the next episode. Bye.